Thank you, everyone. So uh, I'm going to talk about kind of why your private cloud should be more than just OpenStack. And that seems like there's a little bit of an echo. So hopefully you all can hear me now. So uh, as I said, uh, my name is Justin Ancrantz. I'm the head of cloud architecture at Bloomberg. Uh, I'm a long time uh, a committer and contributor to the Apache HTTP server, to APR and the subversion. And I am a uh, former president and director of the Apache Software Foundation. And uh, I have a PhD from uh, University of California, Irvine, thinking about kind of next generation kind of web architectures. Because uh, someone makes a joke that kind of I come from the internet. And kind of particularly uh, in, in relevance to Bloomberg, which is kind of a, a very large uh, kind of focus on the financial area. Kind of our clients are conducting the transaction in the global capital market with about 315,000 terminal users across 180 countries. We operate one of the world's largest private networks. We ingest over 45 billion ticks a day from over 350 uh, financial exchanges. Bloomberg.com, one of our websites, is uh, the global leader in video streams and business and finance. We have about 3,000 developers in New York City and London that are creating our software that our clients are using. So I'd like to talk today about kind of the Bloomberg clustered private cloud, kind of what the mission is kind of from when we started was to deliver new and innovative products to our clients faster. It's a self-contained private cloud. It's uh, intended to be kind of a self-service VM creation to our developers, and it's open source up and down the entire stack. Now that said, it is open source, but it is not reliant on any single technology. We can add, remove, or, or replace any component as we need, and then we had to make some bets on the technology trajectories when we started this in 2012. And kind of as I go along and talk about each one of the components, I'm going to highlight some of the places where we have changed the component because either it didn't work out well or, you know, there was something else that we felt was better. And again, kind of the end idea was to focus on developer tools and what do our developers need to create those new and innovative products for our clients. And basically to achieve that, it's far more than just OpenStack. We can take a look at kind of what, you know, we would say an idealized end-to-end -end developer workflow would be. And, you know, a lot of you in the open source community, this should be, you know, using open source tools, but you have a developer that's working on code. You know, they check in code into, let's say, a Git repository. You know, maybe they'll do a code review with a fabricator or a Garrett, you know, and then they'll do a uh, um, kind of a, a continuous integration with something like Jenkins, and that can go push out to an open stack, you know, and that can go deploy a new version, and then you use something like Chef. So this is kind of the workflow that we're trying to kind of evangelize kind of as the end-to-end -end workflow. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is, you know, as we go from what we, we tend to call human scale to machine scale deployment. And so right now, you know, basically you have kind of two dimensions here. You have one dimension, which is we call infrastructure flexibility, and the other is development velocity. And you can take, you know, where you are today with, you know, I have all these, we'll talk about pet and cattle in a minute, but you know, kind of this infrastructure as a service, you know, allows you to basically create virtual machines on the fly. And then I can combine that with something like Chef, and then I have something that starts to look like what you might call the platform as a service. So basically, you try to take all of these, you know, from a human scale to now I have infrastructure as a service and I have automation. Now I have something that starts to resemble what some might call a platform as a service. So there's kind of an analogy that uh, I think uh, Bill Baker uh, from Microsoft and you know, Josh McKenty from uh, Piston Cloud have kind of popularized and kind of the concept of uh, pet versus cattle. And you, know, you can take this human scale architecture and you think about you have a pet. It's very precious. It's something that uh, um, you care for it. And, you know, if it dies, you know, you're sad. It has a name. And you know, generally, you know, kind of the observation here is it doesn't necessarily scale. You know, I'm not going to have a whole bunch of, you know, I'm not going to have one person who is going to manage, you know, 100 pets. But again, it's basically hardware focused. I'm going to keep a single machine running at all cost. And it's historically used very expensive and large scale hardware. It's generally going to be kind of vertically scaling. And then a loss of a single machine could be devastating. Compared to this to the model we have kind of in, in the example of cattle. And basically machines are created programmatically via API calls. You probably don't even name them, you know, and it, you can basically do bare metal or virtualize through the same interfaces. And, you know, your developers, you provide them a quota, and you can create or destroy them on demand. If you look at Amazon EC2, you look at Rackspace, you look at Microsoft Azure, all of those are kind of the public cloud. 
but for a lot of reasons, kind of Bloomberg has decided to do kind of our private cloud, and so VCPC is our version of those services. And really, it, it, kind of the idea here is to get the developers to focus on the programs. We don't want them to have to worry about provisioning these single machines. They should just be able to go hit an API, they have a VM, and then they can do what they wish with it. And, <clears throat> you know, and, and basically kind of the, the Gibson quote of, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and it just works. And really, you know, we have somebody in, in our company who talks about just having a dial tone infrastructure. You look at kind of all the complexity that goes into the telephone system, you pick it up, hey, I just get a telephone. I don't have to worry about all the things I have to do in order to do that. This is kind of what we're trying to get to with uh, kind of this platform as a service. So now let's talk a little bit about kind of BCPC. And it's a uniform software stack kind of that can run on your laptop, it can run on a small set of machines, or it can scale to racks or rows in the data center. And it, one of the things we'll, we'll talk about is kind of has a concept of head nodes and worker nodes. We'll dive into a lot of what that means. And then all of the chef recipes uh, for BCPC are open source under the Apache license. It's up on GitHub, so you can go to that URL, github.com slash Bloomberg slash chef BCPC. And you can basically, you know, your documentation, you can basically get, you know, BCPC running pretty quickly in uh, your environment. And we'll walk through all of the things. You know, kind of over the years, one of the things is designing scalable, highly available systems with a minimal single point of failure is hard. Uh, if you can kind of see here, there's kind of a uh, quote from uh, the movie Moneyball, and kind of, you know, you have the, the GM and kind of one of the coaches is saying, oh, hey, it's really easy to do, you know, play, you know, first base. And the other guy says, it's incredibly hard. And that's exactly kind of trying to do highly available systems is pretty hard. Now, kind of as I said at the beginning, kind of my background with uh, Subversion and with the Apache HTTP server as well as the foundation, you know, one of the things from Subversion is kind of code is the most single precious asset of a developer. You can't ever allow corruption. You have to have checksums everywhere. You have to try and fail safe, and you have to, you don't, you don't ever try to fix things on your own. At a certain point, you have to say, I have to have a human involved to try to fix whatever corruption or whatever happens. Also from Apache, in addition to working with HTTP Server, I was also responsible for many years kind of supporting a lot of the key Apache.org infrastructure. And the project had mailing lists, you know, CVS, and then, you know, help migrate to Subversion. You have websites, you have virtual machines. And you have developers who, you know, within the Apache Software Foundation, and they get annoyed when it breaks. They just want it to work. So again, I have this experience of trying to do these systems before. Now, one of the things you may have heard about is kind of distributed consensus algorithms, and I'll try to give you a very brief overview of them, and, you know, kind of one of them is uh, kind of the, the leading kind of distributed consensus algorithm is Paxos. The person who uh, originally wrote the paper, uh, Leslie Lamport, recently just won an ACM Turing Award uh, for this, and it's very well, you know, very well deserved on his part. And it's basically, how do I do kind of highly available, how do I make it scalable? And basically, Paxos is probably the key algorithm. You know, basically, the, you can summarize Paxos as the participants have an election and they vote on state changes. And you must have the majority of the participants have to agree on that state change. And the key thing here is when you kind of dive into it, it's about basically 50% plus one. So it means basically in, in practice that I have to have three participants to handle a single failure. And so that basically means, well, I have a single failure, I have two. Okay, well, I can still kind of achieve a majority of uh, kind of the participants. But, you know, if I had two, if I lose one, then you have what is the, the option of having a split brain where, well, I don't know. I don't know whether I have a majority. So you'll generally see, generally see at least three. Now, one of the big uh, complaints about Paxos over the years has been notoriously hard to implement correctly. Actually, if you read kind of Lamport's original paper, it was very abstract. It wasn't actually kind of a computer science. He wasn't actually publishing algorithms. He was just trying to tell the story of how you could basically do kind of state change in a time sequence. You know, you have people like our uh, Butler Lampson come in a little bit later and start to say, hey, here's how you can do some algorithms in that. Paxos has been very hard. Um, kind of a couple years ago, some folks at Stanford kind of uh, came up with an algorithm called Raft, which is almost essentially equivalent to Paxos. However, it split up some of the kind of the, the algorithms and made it a lot more easy 
uh, easier to implement and to understand. And so you, you'll see people talk about RAP now. There was a talk yesterday from some folks at Facebook who are basically doing a RAP-based consensus algorithms for HBase. And again, it's basically kind of the same idea for Paxos. You have a Zookeeper, uh, it's an Apache project, and it has a protocol called Zab. And it's basically the same general idea. However, the one thing where uh, it differs a little bit from Paxos is because Zookeeper can actually skip state. It actually, because it, it, it doesn't have to go everything through the state, it can actually say, oh, well, I lost that, but as long as I have something later that gives me what the value of that key value period, it, it's okay. So it is a little bit simpler to implement than Paxos, but again, the same general distributed consensus idea. So BCPC, we'll go through kind of a list of some of the technologies, and I'll dive into pretty much all of these and talk about um, this and, you know, kind of for the operating system, you know, based on Ubuntu, kind of OpenStack, we use the Ubuntu Cloud Archive. Generally, right now, we're running on Grizzly. We do have a patch or a branch, actually, on GitHub to do for Vanna. Um, hypervisors, KVM, we use Ceph for kind of clustered replicated storage. We use MySQL with Galera for multi-master relational database. We use RabbitMQ with clustered queuing. For logging, we use FluentD, Elasticsearch, and Kibana. For monitoring, we use Zabbix, Graphite, and Diamond. For DNS, we use PowerDNS, LDAP, 389DS, load balancing, HAProxy, provisioning, Cobbler, and Ceph. Kind of the thing here is all of these are open source. And so what did we do here? And there's probably, again, more that I've kind of forgotten. But when we started this, you know, in 2012, there was no highly available OpenStack deployment that was really out there. It was something that kind of the state of the practice was, yeah, you just use NFS, or you just have two nodes and do DRVD. And that was basically the state of the practice. From kind of, you know, at Bloomberg's perspective, we think a lot about reliability and availability. And one of the critical design constraints we had was no shared storage, and we have to have an arbitrary number of head nodes. We have to have just more than two. Um, and so, as I said, we, we classify machines as head nodes or worker nodes. And the head nodes run kind of these highly available services in a multi-master fashion. And then the worker nodes just add capacity to the cluster. We'll talk about self-OSDs, but just think about adding storage to the cluster in Nova Compute, which is basically just adding kind of VMs. And the goal of the system is it should be active kind of whenever all of the head nodes are 50% uh, plus one of them is up the clusters should be in an operatable state. So one of the key things that we thought about was whenever we have a failure, when it may occur, you may have a machine failure, you may have a switch failure, you know, whatever may happen, we want to try and have as little state change as possible. So when we started off uh, two years ago, we uh, kind of started off with something called Pacemaker and CoreSync, and they're open source projects. And kind of the uh, phrase you use there is something called uh, STONA, and it basically stands for shoot the other node in the head. And basically what Pacemaker and CoreSync would do is, hey, I think I have a failure to throw the machine. I'm going to essentially issue an IPMI request to go turn that machine off. Now, that sounds good in theory, but kind of practically it means, well, what if I make a mistake? What if I think, hey, this machine is wrong, where maybe the machine that's doing the check is wrong? And basically, it just starts randomly shutting off other machines in your data center. And that basically was just ending up being too complex. And, you know, when something goes wrong, it's like, okay, now I have to do these massive state transitions to be able to kind of recover from this failure. And we, we just didn't want to do that. And so we basically were, were trying to minimize for cascading failures. Um, and so we kind of moved away from kind of the pacemaker and the core sync to kind of a Keepal ID and kind of an HA proxy model. And in um, Keepal ID, you know, basically, I'll uh, talk about it in a second, basically you're going to have one of the head nodes is going to own kind of a well-known IP address. And this is going to get published, so say a VIP or virtual IP. And then you have the HA proxy on the machine with the VIP is conducting the health checks to kind of say, hey, you know, all, all the other services. And it will basically direct all of the traffic that's given to that VIP and direct it to all of the other head nodes. And the nice thing with this model is you have no state transitions when basically you lose a head node. All that happens when you lose a head node is basically keep alive the basically does uh, its election and somebody else takes over that VIP. So 
for high availability, again, all of the services are multi-master, kind of on the head nodes. They publish a single service endpoint to our client. So our client, they just have an address, kind of if you try to run on the laptop, it's 10.0.100.5. And that basically is the endpoint. That's how you can go talk to all of the services. Under the hood, Keep Alive DS is a VRP, uh, kind of the virtual router redundancy protocol. And every head node in our cluster basically participates in this VRP election. Um, and they basically vote among themselves and they say, hey, yep, I, I, uh, whoever has the highest uh, kind of number actually wins. Um, and, but actually what we actually saw in a, uh, we saw this in a real network partition where basically kind of the, the switch kind of went goofy on us. Um, it, all of them decided to take the VIP. So they all took over this, basically this 10.0.100.5 address and all hell broke loose at that point. Um, and so what we ended up doing is we tied the Keep Alive D transitions to key off of Seth. And it's actually one of the things we'll talk a little bit about later. Seth has a, a fantastic implementation of Paxos, and we've never been able to kind of confuse it. And so if for some reason Seth boats you off that island, well, we're going to make sure that you're not eligible to be in the Keep Alive D elections. Let's say we use HA proxy and Apache HVD. Kind of HA proxy is balancing all the traffic across the head nodes. Kind of where we are doing SSL termination is done by the Apache HVD. One of the things that we notice, especially not necessarily on the management side, but as we talk about kind of the uh, machine scale side, HA proxy doesn't tend to scale all that well. You know, it's basically kind of a single threaded app, um, and we basically we can kind of push it to its limits where kind of the number of connections um, and kind of the throughput of it. Uh, especially on kind of faster networks and kind of HA proxy, basically just, it's not terribly efficient. So for inception and provisioning, uh, one of the things that we needed was it to be able to add, remove, or replace machine. And we actually went a step further and it's like, how do I do development of this cluster? And so we use uh, Vagrant and VirtualBox. Um, and basically uh, Vagrant and VirtualBox, basically with that, you can basically check out the code from GitHub and you can get started on your laptop. Um, kind of just some recommendations about 16 gig of RAM and an SSD. If you do that, you'll be able to run pretty much kind of a cluster without swapping or going to disk too much. And that'll basically get you kind of a three node cluster. And that's basically enough to try to get kind of the system running and kind of, you know, just on your laptop. And if you check it out from GitHub, you know, you basically a combination run a script called VBBox Create, and there's a readme uh, in the repository. And that only slides kind of the chef server and then this was cobbler. Um, and so basically what will happen is I run the vagrant box, it'll basically get configured with the chef server, and then it'll, the chef server will, uh, the chef will run on that machine, the chef server and will install cobbler, which will allow you to do pixie booting. And then you can basically take your three nodes that you want, and you, you'll basically pixie boot them off. And actually one thing, we talked to other people about BCPC, and they're like, you run vagrant and virtual box in your data center. I'm like, no, no, that, that, that's not what we're doing. You know, you're actually running kind of all of this on bare metal kind of when you're in your data center. So um, everything is going to get deployed on bare metal, but just to try to ease development, um, do it on top of uh, Vagrant and VirtualBox. Ubuntu and CentOS, uh, we currently target Ubuntu 12.04 LTS. Um, we often use uh, newer versions of packages. Um, you know, as I said, we use stuff like RabbitMQ and kind of uh, the Percona XUDB cluster and all of those. And, they don't actually make, they only generally tend to make them available for the 12.04 LTS release. They don't necessarily make them available for 13.10. Um, this is something that um, this month, uh, in April, 14.04 uh, LTS will be out. And uh, even though the operating system will be able to jump up, but we have a lot of dependencies on kind of packages, so we'll need to kind of all those dependencies we'll have to pick up uh, and uh, publish uh, Trusty, I guess is the name for 14.04. Uh, and for the head nodes, um, they, they can rely, relies upon upstream versions that just simply aren't in the RHEL ecosystem. Trying to get kind of versions of, uh, up until recently, Ceph really wasn't packaged well for RHEL, um, kind of for MySQL or, or RabbitMQ, and there's just not, the, those versions that have critical fixes upstream just aren't available. Um, but that said, we can basically get kind of a worker node. Um, so you can actually have kind of Ubuntu on your head nodes, and then you can have uh, kind of a CentOS or RHEL or Fedora kind of as your worker node. So it doesn't have to be uniform. We generally tend to do with Ubuntu, but we have a branch that works with uh, RHEL. Let's talk about configuration deployment. Uh, we use a tool called Chef. Um, 
some of you may have heard of it. We, we, you know, there's other tools like Puppet and Ansible and SaltStack, and you can get into arguments over lots of beers about which one is better. You know, we actually took a look at it, and you know, we go back to the fact that we have, you know, over 3,000 developers, and we actually felt that Chef, basically, because it was written in Ruby, and, and, and you actually write the recipes in Ruby, it was actually easier for our developers to understand. And we have a, a lot of our web developers, they're writing Ruby on Rails applications already, and hey, here's write some more Ruby code. They don't have to go learn a uh, kind of a new DSL or anything. It's basically, if they can do it in Ruby. Um, we use the Chef server. Um, we do have kind of, you know, we do know it works with Little Chef, um, and then uh, in Chef 12, um, there's gonna be the Chef Zero is gonna be kind of a, replacement for little chef and we'll see how, how that happens. I think next week is chef comp, so we'll see if they actually release a decent chef zero. So when you have uh, your nodes, kind of you pixie boot them with a cobbler and you basically get them up, then you can do kind of a nice bootstrap and you can basically say, hey, I wanna be a head node or a worker node and basically kind of chef will basically install all of the packages and all the configuration that are necessary. We'll talk about the environment file in chef that's going to have all the specifics about the infrastructure. We store all of the shared info in data bags. We use kind of passwords, usernames, and kind of the good thing from our perspective is all of the passwords and everything are randomly generated. Kind of our, our script as we go through, everything is randomly generated, everything is cluster specific. I could show you the data bag for my laptop, it doesn't matter, it's only one on my laptop. I do another run, I clear out the environment and the data bag, it's going to be all brand new passwords. So we try to do everything secure by default as much as we can. We try to do all the SSL, everything. Kind of for the, the state of the cookbooks, we try to use the community cookbooks in Chef as much as we could, but you can get a sense of we have a very clear vision of high availability and how you try to design kind of these clusters that not all of the cookbooks shared. You know, there's kind of uh, MySQL kind of recipes for, uh, for Chef, but none of them really worked with kind of like Percona and how you do Galera and how you do all the state changes. And so we basically just said, you know, for, for a lot of the cases, we just ended up writing our own cookbooks. Um, and again, everything is Apache license if other people want to pick it up and take it, but we had a very clear vision. So there are some cases where we absolutely do use the uh, uh, kind of the community packages, but there are others that trying to do things in kind of a highly available way, we, we kind of had to do it ourselves. Packaging and upgrading rows with Chef, it's a bit of a disaster actually. I uh, actually just merged a, a PR uh, kind of uh, this week, um, basically trying to get us that, for whatever reason, kind of the ops code, Chef, whatever you want to call them now, um, they originally had posted kind of Debian packages and they had an apt repo. And then they just said, no, we're not gonna distribute that anymore. And they basically left that. And we actually, and like you have to, what they wanted us to do, and they, they came in with a straight face, we have to basically do this curl against, you know, getchef.com, pipe that to sudo bash, and that's your install. And I'm like, no, they, they, no. You know, a lot of our machines aren't even connected to the internet. I'm not gonna be taking some random script that you guys post on your website, running down as root. And I get into huge arguments with kind of the Chef folks. So we stayed in our app packages um, that, you know, we could basically mirror when we don't have internet access. Uh, but I actually did go through because it's just, they kept releasing fixes for Chef 10 um, and basically figured out what their install script was doing, which was nothing complicated at all. And basically take those Debian files and kind of install them. So it's a little bit better. And the other thing we do is we disable kind of the automatic Chef client runs. It's one of the things that been burned over the years of kind of automated configure systems basically blowing up my clusters in the middle of a production. And it's one of these things where it does mean that if I want to do a change, I have to have an operator. But that's almost exactly when something's going to go wrong. So we do have the philosophy of when we do this, we want an operator there to basically, if something goes wrong, it's not like, hey, someone checked something into kind of the Git repository and basically broke all the clusters. We want it to be kind of a manual process. We want kind of an operator to be there all of the kind of the stuff can be done by Chef Client, but we don't want that automatic. It's just kind of from how we vision and kind of stability. So, um, and again, it's one of these other arguments that we have with the Chef guys. And they're like, everything should be, you know, every 30 minutes you should run Chef Client. I'm like, no. And we've actually seen cases where the Chef server dies, you know, it gets into a bad state, 
and it basically loses all of the environment information and doesn't know what the roles are and all, all, everything just goes bonkers at that point. So we actually just disable the chef client ones. So I talked about the environment file. So basically the environment file contains all the specifics. You know, we distribute kind of there's a test laptop JSON file that's in a public repository that works with the Vagrant and the, and the shell script. Um, but it does need to be modified for your local setup. And in Axarela, the only thing that we change in our deployments internally is the environment file. Basically, all it has is IP addresses, any information like that, but everything else uh, is, is exactly the same. We do have a concept of uh, three networks. We have a management network, we have a floating network, and we have a storage network. They can be physical networks, or you can basically do 802.1Q VLAN tagging. And, you know, part of it is we talk about kind of the containment and kind of the isolation, and we don't want kind of all of the Ceph traffic to basically go clobber all of the up and stack VMs. Kind of in the environment file, you specify your hypervisor if you want to do KVM or QMU. Uh, if you want to do kind of your drive layouts for the Ceph, you know, we run a mix of hard drives and SSDs and we can specify that in the environment file. We specify your service address that you'll publish to your kind of customers of the BCPC cluster for kind of the human and the machine scale services. You can specify, you know, stuff like your DNS and NTP servers. And these are all relatively boring information, but this is kind of what uh, you would need to change for your local environment. But if you're just doing the vagrant in the virtual box on your laptop, kind of what we distribute publicly, it'll work, and we can kind of get a sense of what we're doing there. It's nothing terribly complex. So for storage, uh, we use a system called Ceph, um, kind of a... Uh, open source uh, distributed scale-out storage system. And kind of the key insight there is uh, something called the Crest Map. And it basically dictates where the data is stored. And we use Ceph for kind of two ways, uh, kind of for block storage and for object store. Um, and we actually do kind of the, the boot volumes and all of the persistent storage. Uh, everything is backed by, by Ceph. We don't actually use anything locally on disk. And the nice thing, we'll talk about the hypervisor, but the VMs themselves that are running, they don't know anything about Ceph. They don't care about Ceph. They just get a block device. And then we also have kind of the Rados Gateway, uh, which is basically the object store. Basically, you can take the Amazon uh, S3 uh, SDKs and point them at the Rados Gateway, and you can get put all works. And so kind of the key thing when you do a Ceph, here goes the diagram, if I have a VM trying to do some access, I'll run a Ceph client on that virtual machine, on that hypervisor, um, and then it will say, hey, look in the crest map and say, all right, here is the primary data. All right, I'm going to go write some data. I'm going to do it to the primary, and then the primary is going to write it to the, uh, to kind of the others, and we tend to run with a replica count of three. Um, we'll talk more about erasure coding a little bit later, but, um, you know, so that, that way we can basically try to describe the topology of our data center uh, in uh, Ceph. And basically, it can say, hey, I want all the copies. You know, I, I don't want all of the copies in the uh, same rack, or uh, I don't want them in the same row, or however you want to do it. So uh, Ceph, you know, there's a couple kind of components. Uh, there's a Ceph monitor and the Ceph MDF. And kind of, as I mentioned before, about Paxos. And it basically, all the Ceph mons, which is just a small subset, I'd say three to five generally seems to be a good number. You can maybe go up to seven head nodes. Uh, but basically, it's going to run Paxos between all the monitors to vote on the state of the OSDs and basically saying, yep, they're up. So actually, when you're doing the writes and kind of all of the I.O., you're not actually going to the monitors. The monitors are just basically voting on what the state of the cluster is. Uh, each one of the uh, worker nodes are running uh, Ceph OSDs for each drive. You know, and basically, in our data centers, we actually run uh, kind of the Ceph OSDs as well. Uh, we had to write Ceph recipes uh, for Ceph, so that 10 times fast. Um, and we actually, when we were writing kind of uh, all these uh, kind of chef recipes, we were actually ahead of Ink Tank, uh, kind of the uh, commercial uh, kind of support company for, for Ink Tank. And, you know, there's been times where we, we run ahead of them and we're like, hey, we're looking at chef. And they're like, we just started looking at it too. We're like, well, here's a recipe. Here's how we do it. And, you know, again, we have that very strong notion of uh, HA. And some of what they ended up doing doesn't exactly match our topology requirements. We have things a little bit different. We did, uh, but... We do have our chef recipes for it. Again, so the OpenStack uh, VMs utilize kind of the RVDs. Uh, we worked with uh, Ink Tank on uh, kind of auto boot from volume patches so that way uh, the uh, VMs, when they basically go and, and you launch them, automatically a volume is created. And that basically so that you don't have to do anything on the local disk. Uh, and then we have the Rados gateway exposed to the tenants. 
one of the interesting things is uh, kind of if you're trying to do cross data center replication, uh, it's asynchronous. And when does that happen? And kind of the answer is it's eventually consistent. And at some point in the future, data that you write in data center A will appear in data center B. Not exactly always the uh, paradigm. So it, it, within, the, within the data center, within the Ceph cluster, all of the information is strongly consistent. It is when it's there. I know it's written. I know it's available. Somebody else, they won't uh, read stale data. But if I do the radio's gateway and I do kind of cross-cluster replication right now, it is uh, asynchronous. So we use uh, MySQL and uh, RabbitMQ for OpenStack and other, other services in our cluster. MySQL is basically storing all the persistent data, and then RabbitMQ is how all the OpenStack nodes talk to each other. Uh, so if you actually dive into OpenStack, if you don't have MySQL and you don't have RabbitMQ, OpenStack's not going to do anything. Um, so we use uh, MySQL, uh, Glare, as so we use the Picona, SUDB cluster. Um, and one of the, the challenges, I talked about Paxos, and kind of mentioned that it's hard, uh, is that the uh, Galera runs the fast Paxos, and it basically tries to cheat. And we've actually got to see split brain kind of issues with using the uh, Galera, uh, just because, again, the people who are writing Galera, like I said, not their fault, but kind of Paxos is, is hard. Um, and we've seen the split brains and data corruption. We've tried to tweak the replication settings to minimize the corruption window, but even then, there, there are still some cases where we have seen kind of MySQL and Galera not quite do the right thing. Um, kind of similarly with RabbitMQ2 and RabbitMQ3, kind of when we started, RabbitMQ2 was the version that HA was, it was a joke, it didn't work, it was just bad. Uh, but to the credit of the RabbitMQ community, RabbitMQ3, you know, and then there were some kind of upstream changes in uh, Folsom uh, that uh, uh, make, worked out pretty well. And so actually since we moved to RabbitMQ3, we haven't seen any issues with the MQ bus. So that's been pretty good. So we also have kind of logging and monitoring and metrics, and we have all this cluster. And, you know, so we use uh, something called uh, FluentD, uh, Elasticsearch, and uh, Kibana. Uh, FluentD is actually running on the actual machine. Uh, so I don't know how they name these things, but kind of the company behind FluentD is a company called Treasure Data, and so the actual application is TD Agent, whatever. Uh, basically watches all the local log files and parses them. It basically splits them up and uh, gets them, and then once it parses them, uh, TD Agent will inject them into Elasticsearch, and then you can use uh, Kibana to uh, visualize and search all of the logs. So kind of a snapshot there of Kibana. So that's a nice open source way of taking all these log files and uh, parsing them. And if you look at kind of our FluentD uh, configuration file, it has basically all of the parsing for Apache logs, HA proxy, for OpenStack and all that. So we, we've done all that work to basically parse uh, kind of the FluentD uh, on the log files. We actually kind of at the point of replacement, we actually started off using Logstash. And uh, Logstash is uh, written in Java. and um, what we would end up seeing is basically our log stash would go crazy and just doesn't scale well, uses a whole lot of memory. It just wasn't really reliable. So we try to figure out, you know, what else is out there and we kind of came across uh, uh, FluentD and we've not had any problems with that. It's been really reliable, really fast. Um, we use Davix and probably the least damning thing I can say is it's better than nothing. Um, it's not a great solution. Uh, but it does give us a basically alerting for kind of failures. Uh, you know, we have a whole bunch of uh, scripts that kind of Zabbix run, but I will say, you know, we have a lot of reliability issues and it's something that, you know, we're trying to figure out, is there anything open source or, you know, do we have to figure something else out for uh, kind of monitoring and kind of the, the, the alerting aspect of it. For Graphite, uh, we use uh, Graphite and Diamond, and uh, Diamond is actually uh, uh, basically looking at uh, metrics on the actual hypervisor and it's basically putting that into Graphite and we use Whisper as the kind of the database and so we can get nice pretty graphs as well. Um, one of the things from a design perspective is we talked about being self-contained within a cluster and so that's really nice is that, you know, I can run everything here on my laptop but, you know, as we end up deploying more and more of these clusters, having a centralized logging and monitoring and metrics is actually pretty critical to us. So it just simplifies this. This is one of these things where I think we're going to break kind of that self-containment and we're going to basically kind of have a hierarchy or some kind of centralized uh, kind of logging and monitoring. We'll probably use the same software stack or we can figure out something to replace Zabbix. Um, but uh, as I 
So there's something that once you have as many clusters as we do of this lying around that uh, where are the log files and which cluster and that way I can have it all centralized. <coughs> so uh, we use uh, KVM uh, as the hypervisor. You know, if you're familiar with OpenStack, you could use uh, ESX, Hyper-V, or uh, XAM server, but kind of we use KVM. And probably the reason for that was, at the time, it had the best integration with Ceph. Um, and, you know, really was critical to us when we did this, that the VMs, we don't have to tell anything to the VMs about running Ceph. I mean, they, they, they just see a block device, they're happy. You know, for a time, that this just hasn't been an option, although it has gotten better since then um, with, the, with the other hypervisor. We have seen some slight performance oddities in KVM on um, Ubuntu 1204. Um, kind of, you know, now that Ubuntu 1204 is almost two years old, you know, we, we have seen that kind of newer versions of uh, KVM kind of seem better. I mean, get some of that performance overhead or some of those oddities are, are, are reduced. Uh, kind of the other thing is, we're talking about virtual machines, you have to talk about Docker and kind of containers and C groups and LXC and it's all interesting. Um, kind of the catch there is you have to do newer Linux kernels and you know one of the things that you know we were seeing is kind of the, the Red Hat guys for the 6.5 they were basically trying to figure out how do we get Docker out in the hands of our users and they're like we're basically going to port everything that's in the 3x kernel to 2.6 and it's just like whoa and so you have to look at all of the namespaces and stuff that basically Red Hat had to do and even if you talk to the Red Hat guys I'm like that was stupid but they didn't have a choice just basically because of their model they had to basically take all of these massive features that were basically in the 3x kernel, bring them back to the 2.6. So if you're running a, a RHEL 6.5, you, you can run Docker, yay, that's good, you can do C groups and all of that. Um, but the one thing with kind of these Dockers and uh, kind of the container, in it, you're basically what it's doing is, I, I'm doing almost pair virtualization. Or it's, it, it basically the kernel is gonna be the same, but my user space is gonna be different. Um, but what that means is I have to rely on the kernel to provide the underlying storage. And one of the things that we talked about with why we like KVM so much is the VMs have no idea about stuff. They don't know it exists. There are kernel drivers for RBD. We don't like them. You know, we would rather have everything in user space. Um, basically, also I can upgrade and I, I can do things when everything's kernel space, it's harder to upgrade. So it means you really can't directly use Ceph for distributed storage. But as you start talking to people in the industry of what they're doing with Docker, and everybody seems to be doing this, and I don't know if it's crazy or if it's the only same thing, but what people end up doing is they go create a VM and then they run Docker inside the VM. But now I've added a whole bunch of indirection, and is that a good thing? I don't know. Um, but it does, basically, it's also a way of how am I going to run Docker in EC2, right? How am I going to run Docker in kind of these public clouds? I kind of have to do this anyway. So, you know, for the best performance, yes, I could run Docker on the bare metal. What that means, I no longer have kind of my distributed storage solution. So that's kind of an issue. And I have to say on the kind of Cloud Foundry, they have their warden, and they just basically like, well, we want to have our own container thing that, eh, whatever. And, uh, it, it's silly. It, it's, it, Docker is the right thing to do. So you have addressing and authentication. Uh, you have uh, power DNS. Initially, we used a little thing called MyDNS, but we actually switched to PowerDNS, and we can uh, back that up with uh, kind of a MySQL database, and again, using that, kind of that cluster in MySQL. So as we get up in the stack, we can actually reuse kind of these components. So uh, it provides kind of the forward and reverse entries for the VMs, um, and uh, we basically had to do some MySQL view trickery, so it actually looks into the OpenStack database to say what VMs are running, and basically it'll return the query. So basically, the end result, if I have a VM called bar and pin it foo, basically you'll get a DNS entry like bar.foo.bcpc.example.com will resolve to the floating IP. So it's actually, it's, it's trickery, but it's actually, it's not a complex uh, MySQL statement. We use our 389 DS, uh, kind of the Fedora project's uh, LDAP server, and uh, multi-master LDAP within all the head nodes. All the head nodes are running 389 DS. You can use OpenStack Keystone to authenticate against that uh, 389 DS cluster. One of the things that we've got some people on our team working on right now is um, kind of getting all the PAM LDAP and OpenSSH kind of magic so that way uh, we can basically put the SSH keys in the LDAP and then do kind of group authentication. But one of the problems is OpenSSH this a patch. Nobody's ever committed it in the main line to basically look at LDAP when I want to um, kind of go against the public keys. So we're, we're kind of working through that. And rather than, if you're familiar with OpenStack, and it's kind of the same thing with 
all the public clouds as well, is you have a static SSH key pair, and well, what do I do? I now have to share that private key pair with all of the people who need to log into that machine, and that, yeah, it's not very good. Uh, at the time that we uh, picked 389 DS, we tried to look at Open LDAP, but it didn't support true multi-master, although we have someone on our team who's like, I think I can make it work. So I'm like, okay, go try and make Open LDAP work. If you can make it work in a multi-master, so you may actually see us swap out 389 DS. There's a lot of complexity in our chef recipe for how you install 389 DS. It, it's, it's a disaster. It's like you have to start stuff up, have it fail, and start it up again, and rewrite configuration files, and it was, trying to read the recipe was uh, pretty bad. So once I have all of these things, then I can install OpenStack. Um, and and listen, part of this whole thing I, I, I want to convey here is you don't magically just get OpenStack. You can't just do pip install OpenStack and I'm done. And you'll have people who will try to tell you that's what they do. And they're, they're nuts. They're absolutely nuts. So if you have all of these other things that I just talked about, get them all set up, now I can basically install OpenStack. So at this point, what is OpenStack doing? It's managing the creation and the instruction of the virtual machine. You get a horizon for a point-click interface, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get some APIs so I can write some you know, recipes. I don't handle the networking. Um, but you know, as I said, in some material ways, once you have all of this other infrastructure up, OpenStack is just a very small kind of layer. Um, and it's kind of the least important part. You know, everything else, uh, you, don't, you don't have any of this um, and as I said, you know, it is kind of the beauty of open source, you know, you stand on the shoulders of giants. So I'm going to talk about some of the roadmap challenges that we've seen over the last kind of two years, um, kind of especially with OpenStack and Ceph, because I said a lot of people haven't uh, been using them yet. Upgrade procedures. So um, if you talk to Red Hat and you talk to Canonical, they'll both say, yeah, if you're really careful about it, I can get you from Grizzly to Havana, and kind of the releases for OpenStack are letters and they're done every six months and so Grizzly was about a year ago um, and Havana is about six months ago and they're about ready to do Ice House uh, this release uh, this month um, prior to the summer next month in Atlanta um, but basically it's like if you're really careful about it you, 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 you know get the chicken and the voodoo dolls and everything you can probably get from Grizzly to Havana um, and we actually do have it working in, in kind of on our, on our laptops and it's like, okay, we're starting to figure out, all right, how do we get from Grizzly to Havana? So it actually, it once kind of Red Hat and Canonical both agree that, yes, you can do this, we're like, okay, it probably is possible. If only one of them said it, we probably wouldn't even believe it. But once both of them said, yeah, if you're careful, you can do it. Uh, one of the good things, uh, we talked with uh, uh, Russell Bryant, who, uh, who was uh, uh, the Nova PTL, and it's like, you know, they, everybody has been kind of complaining about this. So in Ice House, um, kind of the version will be coming out uh, this month, uh, you'll be able to do rolling upgrades. So I'll be able to take a Havana node, um, a cluster that's all running Havana, upgrade a single node to Ice House. And, um, but uh, as I said, it, it's not merged. Ice House isn't final. A lot of it's going to be the devils in the details. Let's see if they get it right. Hopefully they will. Uh, and then there's this whole thing of, Neutron and what used to be Quantum and Nova Network, and I wish the people who were working on Neutron spent as much time working on Neutron and then they try to figure a name for it. And it's just, it, 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 the best I can say is it's very immature. Um, there's no clear winner in the SDN space. Um, Neutron is ridiculously immature uh, in the Havana release. You couldn't do a level three agent that was redundant. It wasn't HA. Basically, all of your ingress and egress traffic had to go through a single node, which is like, that's stupid. But there was a patch maybe a week or two after the Havana that I got uh, to, to try and do a multi-master L3 agent. But again, it's just something that kind of in Neutron. So we basically been sticking with Nova Network. It's simplistic and it kind of just works. The hilarious thing is, you know, they, they, this whole thing when they did Quantum and Neutron, it's like, you know, Nova Network is dead, you know, no new features. Well, for Ice House, they opened it up for features because basically customers like us were like, no, we're not touching Neutron with a 20-foot pole. And basically they said, oh, look, Nova Network is open for new features. And at that point, all the Neutron guys got scared and they started adding all of the missing parity. I don't know necessarily that it will make everything in Ice House useful, um, but it will uh, hopefully get better in Juno. And then there's kind of keep alive D and uh, L2 spanning between racks. Um, one of the things for VRP is required Ethernet broadcast and ARC packet. And it does mean that we have to span layer two across racks. Can we use any cast overlay, underlay, kind of host a VIP? We actually haven't thought that through. So one thing that we do in having our networks is that we do have to span 
L2 across racks. That's not ideal, but without that, we can't really figure out a way how to do kind of HA across racks. And then uh, for Ceph, you know, I talked about block stores and object store, and if you're familiar at all with the history of Ceph, and actually started trying to do a positive compliant file system. Don't use it. Don't, I mean, you know, we started using it. Yeah, let's use CephFS. And NTank actually came in and like, no, no, don't, don't, don't touch it. And there's a lot of kind of multi-master issues around kind of uh, CephFS. Um, it's still stuff that I, I know that they want to work on and uh, improve, but um, I, I wouldn't use CephFS. Consistency model with uh, RVD and Rados Gateway is very clear. With RVD, I have a single owner. There's only one person who can own that block device at a single time. We don't have to worry about multiple people accessing the block device. And in Rados Gateway, it's whoever the last person that does a put, they win. So, you know, having that consistency is hard. Don't even try to lie. So you'll see other stores just like, oh, yeah, maybe this is, this is consistent. Ceph does a really good job of having a very clear uh, consistency model. As I said, Ceph is uh, synchronous. So what happens when it crosses data center? We don't know. We don't want to know because, as I said, you know, when you start trying to span a kind of a synchronous distributed storage system across data centers, something that uh, we're not quite sure. Uh, one of the things that's going to be in the Firefly release, uh, I know they just did a release candidate, so this will be coming up soon, is erasure coding. You know, as I said, we do kind of a replica count of three, uh, and that basically, all right, we'll, we'll take all the copies and we'll put three of them. Uh, erasure coding, you'll get about 1.4 to 1.6 copies and spread across your entire cluster. Okay, I like the space savings, so what's my failure domain? What is my impact on the networking traffic? I don't know that yet. So there's going to be something that as kind of erasure coding uh, comes out. Uh, it'll be something that we'll need to pay attention to. And then there's kind of HDFS and uh, CephFS and, you know, it's kind of this conflict that I have of, like, I have multiple distributed storage systems. I have HDFS and I have Ceph, and they're kind of doing very similar things. And, you know, one of the nice things with HDFS is you get the data locality. Ceph doesn't necessarily grant you that same data locality. Um, so it's something that, you know, there's going to be work that has to be done. I'd like to thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, a GitHub account. Uh, you can take a look at our recipes, follow me on Twitter, and send me an email. I'll be here throughout the entire rest of the conference. And if there's time, I'd love to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Um, let's see, does that work? Fantastic. Um, so how did you settle on your monitoring solution? So you're using what, whatever crazy name it was, Zbix, something like that? The kind of question is, uh, how did I settle on the monitoring? So you're talking about kind of the uh, Zabbix? Zabbix, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, you looked at like kind of the, the Nagios and kind of the Zabbix and the Ganglia, and we kind of looked at all those, and we tried to figure out which one had the best set of APIs. And as I said, I, I, I can't say that I particularly love Zabbix, but it mostly kind of works. You know, there's a lot of challenges that my that Zabbix is so dependent upon MySQL that I want to have an alert when my MySQL is out. Well, Zabbix doesn't know what to do if there's no MySQL service. So I said it's not great. I said it's one thing I, I, I wish there were better solutions. This may be something where I, I don't know. I don't know. It's something. And there's also kind of the challenge of doing monitoring from the inside the cluster is also kind of a risk. So if you actually, this is where I said, I, I think we're going to break that and, and, and try to run kind of all the monitoring from somewhere else. And, you know, hopefully we'll have to have another cluster watching that monitoring cluster. But, you know, as I said, you know, figure out, you know, who watches the watchers. So, um, as I said, I don't have any particular love for Zabbix. And, you know, you, you got our team that has to work with it. You know, they just want to strangle everybody. Uh, but it's better than nothing. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Justin. All right, thank you.